Hello. Welcome to Fund or Fail, the interview show about tabletop games that are backed by people like you. Fund or Fail is part of the Indie Plus network and adheres to the standards of that community. If you love independently created tabletop role-playing games, check us out on Google+. In Fund or Fail, I'll be bringing on a creator for a project that's currently available for funding or backing at the time of recording. This may be through Kickstarter, Indiegogo, Patreon, or many other fundraising platforms. If you're looking for a project to hack, a project to back, or if you're looking at this project and want a little bit more information, then you're in luck. Now, I may or may not have backed these projects. It's my hope that this interview aids you, the viewer, with your funding decision for this project. If you have questions about this project and you're watching this Hangout on air right now, I have enabled the Q&A, and if you ask a question that's legit and you want to know it from this creator and I haven't asked it by the time we finish here, I will ask the, the creator live. So please get those questions in. Now, to get to our next creator. Tonight's guest is Fraser Ronald. Fraser's current project is Nefertiti Overdrive, Ancient Egyptian Wuja. Funding for this project ends on Monday, April 21st, 2014 at 11.58 p.m. Eastern. This is Fraser's third Kickstarter project. Fraser has backed 19 other Kickstarters. Welcome to Fund or Fail, Fraser. Thanks for having me, Rich. All right, so let's, let's get down to the brass tacks here. Uh, let's talk about the other projects that you've made. What other games have you made, and what was your role in creating them? Um, on Kickstarter, the only other game that I made uh, through Kickstarter is actually Centurion, which uh, we funded and put out. It, that is a game of uh, where you play actual legionaries in the Roman legions. It's very specific in that sense. But I've also um, published two other games, um, Sword Noir and Kiss My Axe. Sword Noir is a mixture of sword and sorcery and hard-boiled uh, fiction, and Kiss My Axe is kind of an ahistorical um, Viking adventure game. Now, on the Centurion game, um, real, real quick, but how close were you to delivering on the promised date for the Kickstarter? We were th two months behind. Okay. Okay. Well, well, as far as RPGs, it's, it's, not, it's not bad. <laughs> not too bad. That has informed the dates for uh, Nefertiti Overdrive. Um, there, there was, I mean, there's a huge learning curve in these things. And, uh, again, you're relying a lot on other individuals to assist you in this. And real life happens. I mean, this isn't, any of the people that were working on Centurion, it wasn't their day job. Um, they had real life that... Uh, uh, as we all know, tends to interfere in things, but uh, people pushed ahead. We kept the backers aware um, through updates, and everyone was very considerate, very understanding, and everyone seems pretty happy when they finally got uh, the project in hand. Like Nefertiti Overdrive, the rules for Centurion were done, so uh, even at a dollar level, people could actually get the rule mechanics, mm -hmm. and then what I did, because, again, we were being delayed, and we knew about the delay pretty early on, um, because there was a delay with the, with uh, there was a delay with art, there was a delay with editing, and there was a delay with layout. So basically, everything that go wrong did. But um, one of the things that we could do is put up the chapters as they were finished in their raw form, pre-editing, pre-layout, in a Dropbox, so that if people wanted to read it and look at it, it was available to them. And then, of course, the, once the PDF was done, before I went to printing, everybody got their PDF. So um, I think. That was part of the reason why everyone was very understanding and patient. But I also think a lot of people that back Kickstarters now are really used to things going over time. So when you say there's going to be a delay of a month or two months, they're like, well, I expected that. So to me, that's kind of like on time sort of thing. Now, you said that you took that into account when you set your date for Nefertiti. Um, how, wh what did you do exactly? So basically, the, um, the time frames that I had been using for Centurion were based on the um, quotes that were given to me, the, the required time frames for the individuals working on it. So in this instance, I increased that by a couple of months. Okay. So we're really hoping, I'm really hoping that we can deliver this in August or September. That's the hope. That's the target. But I promised December for the PDF. And okay. again, so that builds in that buffer. I don't, I, I mean, I'm really hoping that we can do this on the schedule that we have set. But again, Centurion taught me um, 
plan for the worst, hope for the best. So we're planning for the worst. All right, so enough, enough about that. Tell me, what, what the heck is this Nefertiti Overdrive ancient Egyptian Wuja? Uh, dude, that's like a whole lot of concepts. I'm confused. What is this? <laughs> so basically, um, the adventure is set in an ahistorical uh, ancient Egypt. And I use ahistorical um, simply because people who backed Centurion or who knew about Centurion might confuse that uh, Nefertiti Overdrive is going to be something similar to Centurion. Centurion was um, heavily researched, um, was based very much in actual historical fact, and included bibliography in the back. Uh, ancient, uh, the ancient Egypt in Nefertiti Overdrive is, um, I'm not saying it's a great film, but the level of research that went into something like The Scorpion King is kind of like what you're going to get in Nefertiti Overdrive. It is whatever tropes of ancient Egypt you dig, you can throw in here, and it's not going to be wrong. Um, there's some basic historical research, and the idea of the, the fall, the specific fall of the 25th dynasty in, in Egypt was the, was the precursor, um, was the, the thing that generated the concept for uh, Nefertiti Overdrive. And at first, that concept was actually a screenplay. But as I was refining the screenplay in my head, uh, the unfortunate fact is that... Um, Prodigy's uh, Invaders Must Die came on at, at a scene during a fight, and I realized that this movie would be a lot cooler if everybody was kung fu fighting. Um, and then I thought, wow, it would even be better if they if you had not just Egyptians, but you had like Jet Li as, as a Shaolin monk, and Gina Torres as an Amazon in here doing the kung fu fighting. And once that hit me, I went, oh my gosh, I've got to play this game. So in order to play it, I have to build it. So that basically what happened with ancient Egyptian wuja is the setting is ancient Egypt, but the kind of ancient Egypt you might get in a comic book or a Hollywood movie, and then the fighting in it is forget physics, forget common sense. If you can imagine it, you can do it. Finish this sentence for me. I dig Nefer Nefertiti Overdrive because I like playing... Now we can parse this sentence a couple of ways. But uh, I think the best way to finish it would be um, I would dig Nefertiti Overdrive because I like playing insane action scenes. Now, if you want to go with uh, other role-playing games, for example, then you could finish it. I would dig Nefertiti Overdrive because I like playing Wushu or I like playing Dragon Fist. Okay, okay. Who's doing the art? Uh, it's going to be Kieran O'Gorman who did the art for, who did some of the art for Kiss My Axe and did all the art for Centurion. And there's three pieces that are up right now on the Kickstarter page. There's one other piece that's done that I haven't shared yet, but is totally awesome. Um, and again, he is, uh, he's worked in comics, he's worked in role-playing games, he's worked in board games. You can find his work at Mayhem Graphics. Okay. And you said you've got four pieces. How much of that is complete? Those How four much do you have? Yeah, those four pieces are complete. The idea is we're going to have, there's seven pre-generated characters. The seven characters that I imagined in the screenplay are going to be pre-generated, and you can play those characters. Um, and there's going to be uh, a, a portrait of each of them. Um, so you'll kind of get an idea of what the characters look like. There's going to be a few action scenes, uh, and um, there's going to be one setting kind of picture. So we're looking at nine pieces of art from Kieran. Then there's also going to be some... Uh, cartography, there's some maps. I'm hoping to get Mark Richardson to do it. Um, we, I've already talked to him about it, so it's pretty good. I haven't started on that yet because the reason for this Kickstarter is to get money to pay for art and maps. Um, that's, the, that's something I can't do <laughs> unless you like stick figures. So those maps haven't been done yet at all, but we've got four of the nine pieces of art, and luckily uh, Kieran has been able to produce very, very quickly. So I have no concerns with hitting the target for the art and the maps. Okay. And what about an editor? Do you have an editor lined up? I have a few people I would like to approach, but this is, again, I Chris Bullock, who did Centurion, uh, I would like to get him involved again, but he is considering uh, real life and what he can and cannot do. But there are a few other names that I would move to if he's unable to uh, edit it. Um, 
Chris's work was previously mostly academic. Centurion was his actual first role-playing game. It very, it very much suited his uh, experience because, again, Centurion was very historical. Um, and much of it was discussing both the history of periods and how you might uh, interact in the period, the kind of characters you can play, the kind of adventure. So it wasn't that far away from the work that he had been doing previously. But his work, uh, for me, really put the text of Centurion over the top. So I was very happy with what I wrote, of course. I'm egotistical that way. But he made it that much better. So I'm hoping to get him back. Um, but again, this isn't anybody's... Uh, day job, and it might be something that uh, Chris doesn't feel uh, suits his style. Uh, if so, there's a few other people I would like to approach, but again, that's that's going to happen after we fund, <laughs> after we fund, not if, and um, then then Chris will have to make a decision, and then I can move forward from there. Okay. Um, you 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 said that you've got the well. Maybe I, you didn't say that. You talked about Centurion, how, how you had already gotten the rules done. The rules are done for Nefertiti Overdrive? Yep, and again, if you back it at $1 or you back it at $7 or you back it whatever, you'll have access to a Dropbox, which includes the playtest rules, the um, uh, previews of the pre-generated characters, and a what I call a one-pager, which is an adventure kind of hook idea outline that fits onto one page. Um, now, the... So the pl the, I still call them the playtest rules because while it is a complete game and with the rules that you get uh, in the playtest rules, you can play it, things are changing. Um, the game is still in playtest and uh, it probably it will finish its playtest at the time of funding. So basically the end of April is when our playtest phase should be done. Um, and But the changes that have been happening recently for the last couple of months, all the changes have been pretty minor. Um, the biggest change was we instituted a change in how uh, uh, how luck worked, um, and that was the biggest change in the last few months. Okay. I've got a question from the audience that I want to uh, slide in here because I think it's perfect. Pete Figtree asks, are you using, for Nefertiti Overdrive, are you using your house system that you use for uh, Sword Noir and, and Kiss My Axe, or something something different? It's very similar to the um, what we're calling the Swords Edge system that is the backbone of Kiss My Axe and Sword Noir. Um, the thing that is a through line for all of all of my games, including Centurion, are qualities. And qualities are basically single word or short phrases that describe the character. So, for example, the, um, the Amazon is the hunter and the healer. Um, those are two single words that can encompass a lot of different things, and that's an example of a quality. But a quality can also be, um, for example, a, a weary traveler, a scoundrel, um, the perfect soldier, everything is a weapon. These are all qualities that are from the different characters in uh, Nefertiti Overdrive. So that remains the same. That's something that I've used... And I really like it because it allows very easy customization of characters, which is something as a player that I always desire. I really want to be able to make the specific kind of character that I want. And I find that qualities are the best way to do that. Number one, you're not constrained by anything. So it's not a list of skills that you have to choose from. Um, so if you want, so for example, um, the, while there are pre-generated characters in FTD Overdrive, there is also a character creation uh, mechanic that's, uh, so you can build your own. And so if you wanted to play, for example, the Grey Mouser, concept could simply be the Grey Mouser. And then that kind of covers everything that the character, the Grey Mouser, covers. It's, it's, so it's a very simple way. Other than that, other than qualities, uh, the dice mechanics, the task resolution, those are all different. Um, and it's also different from Centurion, specifically because all these games were, are built for specific purposes. Um, and what the purpose for Nefertiti Overdrive was is fast, um, fast, easy, conclusive combat. So the while I think I could have adapted the Sword Edge system to do this, because Kiss My Axe has the same basic philosophy and ethos of play that Nefertiti Overdrive does, uh, the over-the-top action, the lack of concern with physics and common sense, um, I, I really wanted to build Nefertiti Overdrive from the ground up so the system did exactly what I wanted it to do. 
So it's a, it's, it is a different task resolution system. It's a different basic system than any of the other games. How, how crunchy is that? With a Wuja game, crazy action, like how many die rolls pass back and forth have to happen for you to be able to beat up five mooks? Um, it, if you roll well, you can beat up uh, five mooks in a round. Um, but So basically, the, you've got four attributes. You've got concept, elements, uh, drivers, and traits. Uh, concept is very high level. Uh, so for example, the hunter or the captain or the leader. Um, elements are uh, basically miscellaneous, something that doesn't fit somewhere else. So perfect soldier, everything is a weapon. Um, fangs of the serpent. Traits, you basically have two traits of, there's three traits, physical, mental, and social. And you pick two, one high, one low. Um, and then your drivers are things that push you to excel. So for example, um, this seeking, uh, leading people to redemption, um, care of my people, um, uh, loyal to the princess, things like these, emotional drivers that push you to excel. So you have these four attributes and you have qualities in each one of them. And each attribute gives you one die. And they're ranked a die type. So for example, you might have um, physical at D10 and social at D6. So if in this combat you explain how you're using physical, for that, that attribute gives you a D10 to use in the task resolution. So you're going to get four dice. You roll those four dice. One die is initiative, two dice are for success, and the final die is your effect die, and it can create a condition, which if you've played Centurion, you'll know about. It's a penalty that you can apply to another character um, with a very short, like it's also a quality, so a very short description, that then continues on until it's removed. So in an average round, if it's you, if it's, let's say, it's the Spartan against four mooks, those four mooks get all their dice put together. So they're actually kind of on par with the Spartan, but he needs two successes in order to wipe them out. Um, now, if you, die, if you roll well, if you get seven over the necessary number for success, you can do two successes. If you get 14 numbers over the need for success, that's three successes, etc. If you roll well, you can certainly wipe out five mooks in a single round. Boom, no problem. Seen it done before. More likely, it'll take you two rounds. One success and then another success. Um, if you're up against a single mook, like, yeah, no problem. Um, and that's, that is one uh, aspect of this game that some people uh, need to get acclimatized to. When, uh, when I ran the very first uh, playtest at Gen Con um, last year, the... Uh, when they, when they were facing up with 20 bad guys, they all kind of pause and they kind of look at me. And I'm like, seriously, have you seen a Wuja movie? You're going to walk through these guys. Okay, and they do. And that's kind of the ethos of this game is that the player characters will succeed 99% of the time when they're doing things they're built for. So the Amazon is the hunter. She's also the mythic archer. When she's being a hunter and using a bow and arrow, 99% of the time she's going to succeed. Um, if she's trying to uh, uh, seduce a gentleman or amuse some children, ee, not so good. That's not her forte. Um, the monk, however, is the deadly clown, and he's the father confessor. So in a different situation, he's going to come out on top doing something like that. So that's when, when you're... When these characters are facing mooks, when these characters are facing minions, they walk through them pretty quickly. Okay. Okay. Thanks. I appreciate that. That, that really gives me a, a good understanding of how it works. Now, you talked about playtesting. Has this been reviewed? Is there anywhere where I could read a review of the system? I wish. No. What I have done is we recorded a game. So I had a couple of backers join me on... Um, Google Hangouts, and we used Roll20. And so we went through a couple of scenarios. So on the Kickstarter page, there's links to the full two-hour uh, video of us going through a couple of <clears throat> scenes in a scenario, but then there's also chunks. There's the combat scene, and then there's a non-combat scene. So you can see how the actual system works. In the 
in the full two hours, there's some, so each scene, each uh, kind of challenge section of an adventure in Nefertiti Overdrive is, is either loud or it's quiet. And a loud scene has lots of dice rolling. It's a, it's a scene where you're using your mechanics. And then a quiet scene is no dice or few dice. So in the two hours, you're going to see both loud scenes and quiet scenes, scenes where we're rolling a lot of dice and scenes where there's no dice rolling at all. If you just want to see how this system works, then you can look at the combat example and the non-combat example, which is all mechanics. It's all system. But it also includes the over-the-top action. Both concept and elements are what's called action attributes. There's action attributes and standard attributes. Action attributes have two dice, d6 and d10, or d6 and d8. In order to get the higher of the two dice, you need to give an over-the-top narrative of what you're doing. So for example, the perfect soldier. If you say, hey, this is combat, and I'm the perfect soldier, so it's no problem. It's like, yeah, that's, that's a d6. You've explained how the attribute works, but that's not exciting or uh, you know narrative. Um, but if, for example, you're facing off against five nukes and you say, okay, the Spartan begins, raises his shield, begins charging as part of his training, ramming his spear against his shield, creating a cacophony of noise, intimidating his foes as the perfect soldier. Ooh, I like that. I can see that in my head. That's a great scene. Okay, boom. That, that pops you up to D10. Um, and generally what ends up happening in the beginning there's a lot of trying to figure out how this works, um, what can I say, what can I not say, and once people realize that literally, uh, don't worry about physics, don't worry about common sense, give me a really cool scene, just like the wire flu action scenes that you see in these Wuja movies, uh, with the inhibitions down, people, they create the kind of beautiful, acrobatic, uh, violent scenes that I'm hoping to replicate with uh, with Nefertiti Overdrive. And that's in the combat example. You'll see as uh, James and Brian, the, the two backers that are in this, kind of blossom into, oh, I can literally do anything I want. Well, this is what I want to do. So, And I think it's really, really, really important to point out that this game is for cooperative groups. There are some groups where the GM or DM or whatever you want to call them believes it's his role to destroy the players. And the players believe that the GM is against them, trying to stop them from doing cool things. If that is the group that you are in, there is no purpose, there's no reason to back this, uh, this Kickstarter because you will never use these rules because they don't work if you're adversarial. If you have an adversarial relationship at the table, this system does not work. This system only works when everybody is together to create a great story. That doesn't mean that the that the game master is going to make things easy for you. He's not. He's going to make it a challenge because it's fun to overcome a challenge when it's a real challenge. He's not constantly going to be trying to destroy you. There's always going to be those scenes where your characters wipe the floor with everyone because that's also really cool. But you also want those scenes where you're really challenged. So the GM is going to challenge you, but he's not there to kill characters because he can't. The only person that can say your character is dead is you. Your character can be removed from a scene, but they're not dead. And it's the same thing with NPCs. When you wipe out those mooks, they're removed from the scene. And at the end of the scene, you can say, you know what? One of them is alive, so I can, so I can talk to him. Great. He's alive. Talk to him. So it's really, really important that you're part of a cooperative group that really enjoys getting together and creating a cool story with some really, especially really cool scenes, um, really cool action scenes, having fun, going over the top in the combat or even in the non-combat, if that's your thing. And that's, that's how these rules are built. These rules are built for a bunch of people together to have fun and just, just go over the top when it comes time for the dice to come out. Uh, Fraser, I got another question from the audience here, and, and I think you've already touched on some of this, but let's see if we can kind of sum it up for Joshua Ramsey. He asks, if, if somebody's not familiar with your games, what would you say that um, the, the basically the Nefertiti Overdrive plays like? I, you know what? If I was going to say a game that it plays like, I think I would actually go old school hack. Now it's a slightly different ethos. It's a it's it's also very different in the in the customization that's available, 
but it's a very simple system that rewards uh, uh, cooperative action and amusing the other players. Um, and that, if you enjoy playing old school hack, um, again, it's, it's a simple system that's cooperative and l light in both rules but also perspective. Um, you could certainly play Pride and Prejudice or War and Peace with Nefertiti Overdrive, but that's not what it's really built for. It's built for Hero. Um, it's built for Ongbok. It's built for Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon. Um, there's nothing to stop you from playing War and Peace with it. However, it's a light game, uh, and kind of like old school hack, in that it works best when you're just there to have fun. In, in the quiet scenes, you're going to have a chance for your characters to grow, to do the role-playing, to do something dramatic. But there's also it, it also expects you to then, when you get into the fight scenes, to go nuts. So I would say if it plays like anything, it probably plays like old-school hack. But I'm also biased because I love old-school hack, so I hope it plays like old-school hack. Who determines the, the quiet versus the loud scenes? Is that a GM determination? Yeah. So the GM, like most traditional games, the GM is building the is building the adventure, and they're there to put some kind of structure in the story. And there's no requirement to have uh, loose stories or or loose adventures. It's it's how I do things, and it's how I would advise to do things because another of the pieces of philosophy in FTD Overdrive is don't ask me, tell me. So in FTD Overdrive, you never ask. Is there a tree? You say, there's a tree. And I'm going up that tree. And then I'm leaping out of the tree onto the hut next to it. It doesn't matter if you're in the middle of the desert and I haven't mentioned any trees or huts. If what you're doing is you're about to do a really cool scene that requires a tree and a hut, you say, there's a tree and there's a hut. And I'm leaping from the tree to the hut to do this really cool thing. So don't ask me, tell me. That's important for GM flexibility because the players are going to be doing things and they're they're uh, they're not just allowed they're pushed to have take narrative control of their characters and what their characters can do so for example if in your adventure you say the only way that these guys can find this uh, important individual is through this middleman but then one of the players says oh i know that guy from when we served here as a gm you're not supposed to say oh no no that's not the story Okay, yes, but, yes, and, but not no. So that requires a lot of flexibility. If you're the kind of GM that likes to build everything, so you've got everything set out, it's going to be tough when the players then start leaping over and around things that you've built, which they are not only allowed to do, they're expected to do. Because it's not... It, it's not D&D &D where you're walking into a room and you're asking the DM, is there a table here? Is there a chair? No, you as the player say there is a table, and this is what I'm doing with the table. And again, the GM can certainly say yes, but the table is very wobbly. Or yes, and there's a molten lava in a puddle under the table. Okay, fine, but you're not supposed to say no. No is like a nuclear weapon. It's there, it can be used, but nobody wants to use it. And this this is te this is in the text, right? This is this yes. whole idea. Do, is this GM advice or is this mechanically enforced? It's GM advice, but the there's nothing. So again, there's because let me restart that. It's GM advice <laughs> because this works for a cooperative group. There is very little structure for building adventures. There is how I do it. There's two uh, included adventures to show how it can be done, but because every GM style is different, it's very difficult to give strict uh, strict rules as to how things are done. All of the rules for Never TD Overdrive fit in 10, 8.5 eight by 11 pages. Um, and if you remove the example text, it's maybe 9. It, again, it's a very light system, and it's trying to remove... Um, com it's trying to remove complexity, number one, because it's, it, we want it to be fast and loose. But if you're in a cooperative group, which this really does require, the, the need to shackle either the players or the GM is absent. So 
in the rules as written, in the this is how you play the game section, there is GMs can say yes and yes but, but they should not, not cannot, should not say no. So that is there in the rules as written. But again, it's it's pretty tough to, I mean, I could, I'm sure I could mechanically put something in there, but then the game master would have to enforce that rule, or the players would have to rebel against the game master for not enforcing the rule. So uh, it's 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 in there, but it's not mechanically in there. Okay. Okay. Um, all right. Well, at the time of this recording, Fraser, you're sitting at uh, this is in Canadian dollars, one thousand nine. I have no idea what that is in American dollars, so I'm just going to say it's Canadian. Like three dollars. cents. <laughs> One thousand nine hundred and thirty Canadian dollars against the goal of five thousand, and you've got twelve days to go. What happens if this fails? If you can't, if you, if you don't make the the pledge drive, what what happens then, Fraser? I've got two choices. Um, actually, I've got three choices. One choice is just to let it go. Um, that one of the beauties of Kickstarter is that this allows us to test the market. Um, I think I've got this great idea, and I think it's awesome, and everyone that's played it loves it. So I strongly believe that this is a, a great game that, if it gets out there, people would love. But the market might tell me something different. Um, so if I don't make the $5,000, one choice is simply say, well, this is, this is a project that failed, and hopefully I can reuse the, the art that I paid for in something else. Um, I can also... Uh, stick with what I have now, the investments that I've made, um, and not get the maps and the other art and that sort of thing, and, and publish it as is. Um, that's possible. But again, also, there's nothing to stop me from rejigging. So, for example, I might uh, remove maps, lower the amount of art I have, um, try to cook a deal on layout and editing, and try Kickstart again at a lower price. I mean, that's a possibility too. Um, and it would really depend, I think, on where I end up. Uh, if I'm like four thousand five hundred dollars, I think that tells me to give it another shot with slightly lower costs. Um, if we don't see much more movement than what we have now, or if people start pulling out, then I think that tells me that there's there's either publish it now in, in the form that it's in and try to make back the money that was invested in already or just let it go. Um, and again, it, it'd be tough to let it go from, from the work you put into it, but the market might be telling me something. And uh, if, if you study business at all, which I don't, but my wife does, um, there's, there's something called the sunk cost fallacy, meaning if you've already spent the money, it shouldn't impact on your decision that you need to make. That money's gone. So... If if the if the smart thing to do is to just let it go, then you should let it go and ignore the fact you've that you've already spent that money. That's a tough one to do, though. So I've got I've got three options, and uh, we'll f we'll see how I feel if this does fail. Okay. Well, hopefully you uh, you don't you don't hit that point, but I think you've got some options to consider now. Yeah. What's the best possible outcome for the time uh, remaining for this project? If I mean, if I'm being uh, practical, if if I'm being realistic, then uh, just funding is probably uh, is probably the the best case scenario right now. That hitting 5,200 or 5,500 is probably the best case scenario. But if we could hit our first stretch goal, it would be awesome because part of it, what's in Nefertiti Overdrive that we haven't really talked about is a scenario creation system. And this is an, um, a separate mechanic where the GM and the players get together and there's specific, uh, you call them attributes or headings, like setting and genre and themes where the players all get dice, not to roll, but to bid. A high dice is worth the most, low dice is worth the least. And for each of these headings, they bid. So if you really want to go a uh, high level, and decide on the genre, you might bid your d20. And then you tell them what the genre is. So, uh, for example, steampunk, or um, Star Wars, or uh, the Three Musketeers. It can be anything, Some, but something pretty high level. But there's more than one. So you might get steampunk, Star Wars, Three Musketeers. That's your genre. 
And then for setting, again, people are bidding, and they can say anything they want. Setting is basically where it's happening. Somebody might say archipelago, and the other person might say Milky Way. Suddenly, you're getting these ideas of, like, in space, floating asteroids that people live on or something, an archipelago in the Milky Way. So on. It goes on like that. And the idea is that um, this, this is a way for a GM to be certain, absolutely certain, that the players are invested in what they're about to play because they are bidding on it, on what's important to them, and they're telling the GM what they want. Now, depending on how you run games... You can either, at the point of character creation, go, okay, you guys go create your characters. I'm going to try to create something with what you've given me. Or it might be the character creation session and setting creation ses session. And then the next time you guys play, the GM has used all those ingredients to cook up a campaign. When I play tested this with my Ottawa group where I live, they came up with something that just blew my mind. It was Steampunk MMA. And it was um, Archipelago, historical, um, or Victorian Europe, or sorry, alt history Europe. And there was a plague, and there were supernatural forces at war, and all these other things. I'm just like, oh my god, this is so awesome. So that's what we ended up playing for a long time. Instead of actually playing Never TD Overdrive, which we were supposed to be playtesting, they created this not not just a setting, but like a whole scenario, uh, everything about it, campaign setting kind of thing that I just loved. So we've been playing that for a while. If we hit 7,500, then that's going to be published as a PDF. Um, and there'll be the option, uh, at minimum, it's going to be 2,500 words at minimum. It's I'm pretty sure it's going to be bigger than that because there's a lot of stuff I want to include. I mean, Sunken London itself is probably a good, you know, 5,000 words right there. But um, if we hit $7,500, and that's going to be the stretch goal. We're going to publish that as well, at least as a PDF, if large enough as print. It's not going to be included in the actual Nefertiti Overdrive book because one of the things that happened with Centurion was the stretch goal increased the size of the book so that printing costs went above what, what we were planning for. So we're not going to do that. It's going to be a PDF. If it's large enough to print separately, what I can do is put it through... Uh, print on demand at drive through and then give everyone that backed it the coupon to buy it at cost. So it, you wouldn't have to pay extra for it, but uh, it wouldn't it wouldn't start eating up whatever money we were able to make for printing. So as an optimist, that's the that would be the best because really I I would love to be able to bring um, what I'm calling daredevils of the water waste to. Uh, to my Kickstarter uh, backers. All right. All right, well, Fraser, I appreciate you coming on Fund or Fail, and I wish you the best of luck with the 12 days you have remaining. Now, again, this is Nefertiti Overdrive, Ancient Egyptian Wuja. It is on Kickstarter right now, and uh, it will be there until April 21st, 2014. Thanks again, Fraser. Thank you, Rich.